Good evening, and thank you for being with us. We are very pleased today to have with us Dr. Valérie Morin. Dr. Morin has completed her medical studies and residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Laval University in Quebec City. She completed then a fellowship in maternal and fetal medicine at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Morin works as an obstetrician at the Centre uh, Mère Enfant Soleil at the Centre Hospitalier Universitaire de Québec. She is president of the Perinatal Morbidity and Mortality Committee at the CHU of Quebec. She is also full professor at Laval University and responsible for the MAD 1223 Reproductive System course at the pre-clinical level for medical students. She is involved in teaching externs and residents in hospitals. Dr. Morin, I invite you to take the microphone. Thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me. So today we will talk about spina bifida and hydrocephaly, the different uh, pregnancy-related issues. So it's the first time that I make a presentation on that topic. And so I had the chance to do a literature review, and I'm very happy to present it, to share it with you today. So the objectives at the end of the presentation, what I hope it is that at the end of the pres presentation, the participants will be able to know what are the uh, recommendations pre-pregnancy, then the particularities of pregnancy monitoring and delivery, and the postpartum recommendations. Now, it is interesting to see and that's an article that was published in 2020, quite recent, that women with spina bifida have more difficulty compared to others to get information related relating to pregnancy. And that's for two reasons. First of all, there are very few studies done on the topic, and the healthcare staff is very little informed. However, for several years, there are more <clears throat> and more women with uh, a, a physical disability who decide who choose to have a pregnancy. Now, we will begin with a few general information regarding risks correlated to uh, pregnancy and the risk related specifically to spina bifida and hydrocephaly. So, women in general with a physical disability have an increased risk in pregnancy for for example preterm labor so after 37 at 37 weeks we are considered at term so we know that women with spina bifida have more risk to deliver early so because of premature rupture of membranes and also because they have higher risks of hypertension. So even though in pre-pregnancy they don't have those uh, symptoms, they might develop those systems, symptoms during the pregnancy. And they can also have what we call preeclampsia, which is hypertension related, well, with an increase of uh, swelling. So, it's a predominant type of swelling and also a higher level of proteins in uh, urine. So depending on the number of weeks, it could lead to a premature delivery. And in some cases, the delivery has to begin earlier. And we know that it also increase the <clears throat> urinary tract infections because of the action of uh, progesterone. And women with spina bifida are more at risk for urinary tract infection. So if it's not treated, we also have higher risks of uh, pyelonephritis. So all women with physical uh, disability have increased risks in pregnancy in general. So in this case, the risk of C-section is around 39%, according to a study published in 2019, I think. While for women without uh, physical disability, the risk of having a C-section is of 20% only. So why women with spina bifida are more at risk of uh, having to do a C-section? Well, there are many reasons for that. 
a little bit more risks of um, rich presentation. So when the baby is not well placed, we talk about malpresentations and there are different types of malpresentation. It can be on the shoulder size side or on a bridge. And in those cases, we go straight to the C-section. Another thing, for example, a person who has um, a lung issue, if there's a lung damage that is important, the women will be oriented towards um, a C-section again. If there's also pelvic deformity, in some cases, the, the baby could have a hard time passing. So there's a deformity in pelvis. So in that case, again, the C-section is recommended. And also women who had a urinary reconstruction. So in that case, usually we consult with the urologist to see what are the risks associated, what are the, the, the risks uh, when there's a delivery by natural uh, means. In some cases, we might go to the C-section again. One thing that is interesting, women with spina bifida, with hydrocephalus and ardent carry anomaly are more at risk uh, compared to the women who only have spina bifida. So in that case, it's difficult to explain why women with hydrocephalus are more at risk of having C-section. One explanation for that, and uh, one reason why they're more at risk to have a C-section in general when there's um, disability, well, a reason for that is that the, the healthcare professionals often are more uh, worried, they have more apprehension. So that's why they would tend to go to the C-section option. Then women with hydrocephalus without uh, spina bifida and who have a shunt, in that case, the risks are quite comparable to the general population. When you have hydrocephalus and a shunt, the risks are comparable to a regular pregnancy without this type of condition. One thing to keep in mind when the uterus is uh, becoming bigger, there's a risk, especially during the third, uh, the third quarter, there's a risk of obstruction at the shunt level. So in that case, this could cause um, headaches. It could cause quite important discomfort. In the majority of cases, a conservative treatment would be sufficient to um, reduce the symptoms. And it's rare that a woman will have to be operated because her shunt is obstructed. So usually hydrocephalus with shunt is a condition that is quite regular during the, the, the pregnancy and the shunt keep on doing its work normally. Now, we noticed also that in that same group of women, there's a higher risk of postpartum depression. So it's something that has to be monitored uh, after the, the birth. What are the recommendations, the pre-pregnancy recommendations? So when it's possible, it's always good to consult in the case of hydrocephaly and spina bifida, it's important to consult also during pre-pregnancy because it's helpful to make an evaluation assessment for possible tests before pregnancy and then to uh, plan with the woman the follow-up. So first of all, the evaluation of the medical condition, assessment of medical condition. So depending on the condition, it will have uh, different risks. So uh, it's important to assess the significance of neurological damage. Other things that have to be assessed, first of all, the respiratory system. One of the things that comes into play if there's a scoliosis, for example, and what 
uh, it may entail the CIPO scoliosis or scoliosis is a syndrome, a restrictive syndrome at a respiratory level. Most women with restrictive symptom will tolerate the pregnancy, but their condition has to be assessed with respiratory tests before pregnancy to see what to expect during the pregnancy. So most patients will well tolerate the pregnancy. Sometimes during the third quarter, because of the volume of the uterus, there's a higher compression on the respiratory system. And so in some cases, the patient will have more uncomfort or more difficulties in um, uh, respiratory difficulties. And those are reasons to anticipate the delivery. Same thing for the urinary condition. Uh, the tests and uh, like in respiratory condition, we make a whole set of tests to plan ahead of time. For urinary condition, especially for women who had uh, frequent um, urinary tract infections, it's important to make the assessment to see if there, or there were no impact on kidneys because that increased the risk of complications during the pregnancy. Then we know that the pregnancy itself increases the risk of um, constipation. So the digestive system has to be assessed as well. Then we know that in population in general, the risk of anomalies at the neural tube level is uh, of 5.6 cases. If we have a, par a parent of a first degree, uh, first degree relative is father, mother, brother, or sister who has already um, a tube defect, then the risks are increased up to four to five percent. We know also that the use of folic acid can um, prevent the risk of uh, neural to anomaly. So folic acid is an essential element and it's particularly involved in the development of the neural tube. So we know that the it is even more necessary, especially at the beginning, the first part of pregnancy. And it's very important to take up some vitamins, including folic acid, in pre-pregnancy and at the beginning of the, the, the pregnancy. So all vitamins are enriched with folic acid, and that helped reducing the, the risk of anomalies. But we also need a surplus of folic acid in pre-pregnancy period and at the beginning of the pregnancy. Folic acid three months preconception. So this is recommended for everybody. Why is it recommended before conception? Well, you have to know that the closing of the neural tube, the closure, happens quickly after conception. So uh, neural tube closure is estimated to be 28 days after post-conception, so six-week pregnancy. So at that point, the neural tube is already closed. Therefore, it's very important to have a good quantity of folic acid in pre-conception period and during the first part of pregnancy. Recommendations for persons who are at risk, moderate or high risk. Well, the recommendations. So three months pre-conception, the dose is 0.4 to one milligrams per day. So they must contain at least 0.4. Uh, most capsules contain 0.4 milligrams, but most will also contain one milligram. If you have uh, someone in your family, first degree relative, so mother, father, brother, sister, you should take four to five milligrams of folic acid per day, at least three months pre-conception. Uh, Something we neglect sometimes are 
is that the Canadian recommendations say that we shouldn't only take folic acid in preconception, you should also take a multivitamin with, there's iron, uh, vitamin C that can reduce some uh, anomalies like cardiac uh, anomalies. Of course, folic acid is the most important vitamins, but you should not neglect other vitamins. Uh, so you should take it in the context of a multivitamin, but if you are at risk, you, as I said, you should take up to five milligrams. In multivitamins, there's usually only one milligram of folic acid, so you could take one uh, uh, multivitamin and separately take uh, three to four more uh, milligrams of folic acids but you must uh, be careful not to take too many uh, multivitamins. For example, some uh, vitamins are dangerous in large quantities like vitamin A. Some multivitamins already have uh, five uh, milligrams of folic acid. We can prescribe that too. What we have as recommendation pre-pregnancy is this for vitamins. For the antipartum follow-up, so that means before pregnancy, during pregnancy, what we do for the follow-up. Oh, so after pregnancy, so prenatal vitamins, we continue them for up to 12 weeks of pregnancy with people that are at risk. So that is four to five milligrams of folic acid. Like I said, the most important is preconception and at the beginning because the neural tube closes quickly. After the first trimester, so 12 to 14 weeks of pregnancy, then we can come back to the one milligram dose. When you take multivitamins that have four to five milligrams of folic acid, the risk decreases from four to five percent to one percent if you take all the necessary vitamins. Like I was saying, after the first trimester has passed, you can go back to normal multivitamins. You don't need to take a surplus of uh, folic acid. That will not make a difference for the, if you take that for the rest of the pregnancy. For the nuchal translucency ultrasound, that is recommended to everyone at the beginning of the pregnancy. What we do is around 12 weeks, we measure the thickness of the baby's neck. If we say that it is augmented, there is a higher risk of an anomaly. So that is a prenatal um, screening that we do. This is a typical one. More and more there are studies on the intracranial uh, nuchal clarity. We can also measure the intracranial one when we do this. The cerebral trunk is measured, and if it is enlarged here, we know there are more risks that the baby may have a neural tube anomaly. So if we see this at 12 weeks, uh, a thicker size here, we would recommend an earlier uh, scan, so at 16 weeks. If everything is normal, we do this ultrasound at 20 weeks of pregnancy. In the past, uh, we would give a dose of alpha fitoprotein to women um, with spina bifida because we knew there was a higher risk and uh, the alpha fitoprotein with the mother would be higher. So when our scanning ultrasound machine were not as good, we would do this, but now we have excellent machines to evaluate the neural tube for the fetus. What do we follow during pregnancy for a patient with spina bifida? 
So there can be an increase of mobility problems because of weight gain. Also the fact that progesterone relaxes muscles, ligaments. Maybe there's a, a less well-supported structure and that can cause a uh, mobility issue as well. So the pelvis here would be less supported. And the center of gravity uh, may be less stable. So we follow up on this. If uh, a patient is non ambulatory or sh she uses a wheelchair, we know there are higher risks for thrombophlebitis because there is a stagnation, coagulation of inferior members. Also, there are coagulation factors during pregnancy that are higher. So when there is less movement, there is this risk of thrombophlebitis. This is a case by case situation, but we have to uh, discuss if we have to give an ample prophylaxy to decrease, uh, so an antibiotic prophylaxis to decrease this. These are medication that we have to inject it is contraindicated during pregnancy to use the oral form. So there's a subcutaneous injection, which is scary at the beginning, but people get used to it uh, if uh, they need it. Same thing if someone has diabetes during pregnancy and have to inject uh, insulin, it's the same approach. We said there are uh, higher risks of UTI during pregnancy for all uh, pregnant women. So we uh, do a urine culture because pro progesterone makes the uh, urinating uh, uh, trickier for pregnant women. So UTIs are a risk. Uh, and if there is a UTI, there's also a risk that it can go uh, to the kidneys and cause other issues. So even if people are asymptomatic, we treat all UTIs. Uh, we do check it in with blood tests uh, in the beginning and do a urine culture at 20 weeks. For neurogenic bladders, the risk is uh, even higher. So this is why we do regular urine cultures once a month. Even if there are no symptoms, we will treat the infections even if they are asymptomatic. So during pregnancy, if uh, since there are more risks of complications from a UTI, we treat it. It can uh, increase the uh, early uh, delivery uh, risks as well. So we monitor this. If someone has repeated UTIs during pregnancies, we can uh, give a dose of antibiotic prophylaxis that they can take daily to re reduce the risks of uh, these infections, but we only do it if uh, they are repeated. There's a higher risk of urinary retention and incontinence, of course, uh, the uterus weighs down on the bladder and urinary self-catheterization uh, self-catheterization can be more difficult at the end of pregnancy as well there can be swelling uh, so this is especially at the end of the pregnancy a higher risk for constipation during pregnancy again uh, this is a fault of progesterone uh, the, the bowels react uh, slower so laxatives are taken as needed. Many patients will need this during pregnancy. Depending of uh, the level of the lesion, there are cases where uh, patients will not feel the contractions. So to feel the contractions, the nerves that allow us to feel the contractions are 
at uh, the roots of T10L1. So if a woman has a lesion that is higher than T10L1, it is possible that they will not feel their construction contraction. So it's important to evaluate where the lesion is located, because if it is higher at the end of the pregnancy, especially it's important for the woman to feel her abdomen to know when there is a difference. Uh, so there can be a, a beginning of labor, some discharge, uh, abnormal discharge, so th they have to follow up on this. If there is a lesion at T6, there is a risk of autonomic dys dyslexia. We will talk about this later. When uh, the pregnancy continues uh, later on, we will ask a neurologist or neurosurgeon to ask if there's a contraindication with vaginal, vaginal delivery or with pushes. In general, there are no contraindications uh, with vaginal delivery or pushes uh, on a neurological point of view, but we make sure to uh, check this with a neurologist or neurosurgeon. If uh, there are errors of lung damage, we do follow-ups with a pneumology specialist. If there's a higher risk with compression from the u uterus, we follow up to make sure this is safe for the mother. With the urology, especially if there was a reconstruction uh, with the urinary, urinary system, the bladder, we check if there could be a negative impact with vaginal delivery. With infectionology, again, if there are repeated UTI, we uh, have to, of course, give an antibiotic that is uh, compatible with uh, pregnancy and infectiologist specialists will help us choose the right antibiotic. So with Anastasia consultation, we will talk about this uh, during the intrapartum period. This is very important. If someone wants to, says they want to do a natural delivery, we never know how labor is gonna go. If someone has a lesion on their spine, it's very important to have anesthesia. And so we need a plan before labor. Other professionals uh, that can be included as needed, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, and nutritionists, all uh, to help uh, a safe return home. And there's organizations that can help uh, a safe return home. I didn't know about it, but a patient told me about uh, Clinique Par en Plus. Maybe a lot of uh, people listening here know about it. I did not know about it, but it's uh, r really interesting. It's a, a government organization. The services are targeted for parents, future parents, or grandparents of a baby aged two years or less, or that uh, these parents, these people would have uh, a motor deficiency or neurological uh, disability that affects their capacity to take care of the baby. And so the person has to live uh, in Quebec, anywhere in uh, Quebec. So one patient told me, a patient told me about this, uh, uh, and I think it's a very interesting possibility. Intra-partum follow-up. So, what you have to keep in mind is that for most patients, the vaginal delivery is going to be possible. If there's nothing against that, then we will opt out for vaginal delivery. We know that women with hydrocephaly and with a shunt uh, for them, uh, vaginal delivery is also to be favored. So vaginal delivery, if there are no contraindications, 
then we wait, we wait for the, the spontaneous labor unless there's a maternal condition that is such that we need to intervene before or a deterioration at the respiratory function level. Possible also that it's easier to, um, to plan a medical induction, especially for a patient who's uh, living far away from the hospital, because we know that pa parents with hydrocephaly or spina bifida will uh, uh, deliver sometimes a little bit further away uh, their re regular center, health center. So um, for practical reason, a medical induction might be foreseen. If there are uh, women with uh, higher uh, lesion of the, the damage of the, um, of the spine, uh, maybe they need to have a closer monitoring because they won't feel the contraction. So then there's the obstetrical labor, three stages. The first stage is the beginning of contractions. So opening of two, three centimeters when the labor begins until the full openness. So when the, the, the mother is ready to push. So the first stage is until 10 centimeters. Second stage is the expulsive phase. So from 10 centimeters until the, the birth, this beautiful child that we see here, one of the things that we need to keep in mind and the hospital, the, the nurses are used to that and they are careful when they start the patient to push, it is good to assess in pre-delivery or even during the delivery evaluate, assess what are the limitations in terms of movement. So if a patient delivers, and that's what we see the more often uh, at the hospital's disposition, we have to see how we can mobilize the, the legs of the patient to, um, to avoid moving the, 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 the legs. And in some cases, it can cause uh, problems subsequently. So it's important to assess the position for the patient so that the patient can push correctly. If we see that the, the, the patient has her feet rested, it's okay. Or we can have a support for the whole leg. In that case, the patient do not need to, to force because the, the, the legs are, are sustained, are supported. So this has to be assessed at the beginning, before. So to avoid to have any any wounds, any injuries because of a wrong positioning. If a woman, for example, has a contraindication for pushing, that doesn't mean that we need to do a C-section. If we have a, a difficulty in pushing at the second stage, especially with an epidural, so if a patient is under epidural at the second stage we can let the baby uh, go by himself and we can let the baby go down for an hour or two and then we may use instruments so it's not because the patient cannot push that automatically a c-section is needed and then the third stage is the delivery of the placenta so uh, once the baby is born until the placenta is expelled at the third stage of labor. So if there's a C-section that is indicated because uh, of uh, pathology at the pelvis level or pulmonary respiratory issue, in that case, we try to plan the C-section as close as possible to the term. But then if there's a maternal condition and that comes into play, then in that case, we might have to schedule the C-section before 37 weeks. In the case of a woman of hydrocephalus with a shun, if we do a C-section, we need to uh, give an important antibiotic, uh, antibiotic prophylaxis because there are higher risks of infection, especially at the shunt level. Uh, often, uh, we uh, try to, to mob not to mobilize, not to touch the shunt, but there's always a risk of infection with the shunt. So that's why it's important to give antibiotics. So it's something that we have to think of ahead of time. 
if we talk of anesthesia and analgesia now the uh, root nerves here are t10 l1 so that's particularly important at the first stage of labor and the second stage uh, it's the it's at a lower level and it's the s2 s4 uh, that intervene and that's where uh, the the mother begins to to feel the 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 pressure to push so for vaginal delivery and cesarean c-section what are the needs in terms of anesthesia and an analgesia so we need actually even during the um, the pregnancy, and we need to look at the options. If the person needs a full anesthesia or just a relief, it's important to discuss it before. But when we talk about anesthesia, analgesia, we have to keep in mind that we need to relieve the mother, but keep in mind also that everything that we give to the mother passes to the child. And as the child will have to, to learn how to breathe, it's important not to give medication that will play on or have an impact on the respiratory system so avoiding narcotics but most of them they have a longer action and um, so the baby might have a, an impact at the respiratory level so we prefer anesthesia that are on a shorter term so if the woman wants a epidural type of anesthesia uh, spina bifida is not a contraindication. However, the technique may be a little bit more challenging. In some cases, it's impossible to, to do. So the women need to be assessed by the anest um, anesthetist. And uh, if the woman can get what she wants, that's fine. Otherwise, uh, we have to look at the alternatives. And also what may happen is that with the uh, epidural, even though the technique works, sometimes the relief is lower when uh, the person has already had a surgery at the spine level because um, the dissemination of the medication in, the, in that area might be lower. So the medication won't uh, disseminate as it is supposed to, to do. So, and then hydrocephaly with shun is not a contraindication for epidural. So there's no major contraindication if a woman wants an epidural anesthesia. Epidural is an injection of medication in the epidural space. And that's where, well, if there are adherences, the uh, medication won't be uh, flowing correctly. So that will reduce the, the relief of pain. And then that's a catheter that is left there. So it allows the injection of medication to go on during the whole uh, del delivery. So once the epidural is done, the catheter is well fixed at the, the level of the back of the woman. And during the, the, the labor, there's a ongoing flow and it's local. That's why there are no repercussions on the fetus. So uh, the nurse can adjust also the dose of uh, injection if the woman needs more relief. Now, if we do not have access to epidural and we want to have a relief, there's also a narcotic that we can give. It's fentanyl and it's quite an efficient uh, product and the, the good thing with fentanyl is the fact that it has a very short uh, lifespan, short action. So in that case, we do not risk any uh, respiratory issue with the baby. So the patient usually can self-administer the fentanyl during the, the labor. What are the other alternatives? There's also what we can, what we call the, the block pudental. So it's a local anesthesia that is done at the, the pudential nerve level, and it relieves the mother 
uh, during the, the pushing uh, stage. So only when the baby goes through uh, and, and is born. So the, 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 the mother will feel her contraction, but she will be, uh, she will feel less uncomfortable. So this is done when the, the baby is really ready to, to be born. Otherwise, when the patient didn't have any anesthesia, we can uh, also freeze locally with that, with that approach. Now, other possibilities like immersion in water when a, a woman can, when a woman is um, mobile. So in that case, the, it's better to tolerate the pain. There's massage, pressure, other, other techniques like sterile water injections that can uh, free some endorphin and make the contractions more tolerable. Um, so some patients will use that and also other techniques of relaxation. Uh, hypnosis as well is a technique and many other possibilities to relieve the, the pain. Now, if a woman needs a C-section, if the patient is already with epidural, at that point, the uh, C-section will happen with the, the epidural. So with the epidural, we already have a certain dose of medication, but we can still push. If we have a C-section, then in that case, the anesthesia, uh, the, the quantity of the anesthesia will be higher. So in that case, the, the woman won't have any, won't feel anything. If the woman wasn't under epidural, if uh, at a certain point we decide to opt out for the C-section or if there's uh, an issue at a urinary level. So in that case, if it's possible, we do what we call a spinal anesthesia. So basically the medication is not injected exactly at the same place as the epidural. And the medication has a lifespan of a couple of hours. So it's not used during the labor. So in that case, it gives a complete uh, block to, to the, at the motor level. So in that case, the, the patient cannot push anymore. So this is an illustration of uh, uh, the previous technique, if the patient has a contraindication to epidural, in that case, the C-section is done under general anesthesia. All the medication go through the mother and all the way to the baby, as I said. So with the general anesthesia, uh, we need to be ready. And once the mother is um, has her anesthesia, we begin immediately the intervention. C-section can last between 20 minutes and 45 minutes. But what is long, what takes longer in the C-section is uh, then closing uh, the, the C-section. So usually in the five, within the five minutes of the intervention, we get to the baby. So normally the babies do not have time to be uh, put to sleep because of the anesthesia, because it's they're, they're taken out very quickly at the very beginning. So usually it's not a problem because it, it goes very fast. So the, the baby won't get the medication like the mother. A few words on autonomic dysreflexia. This is for people who would have a lesion at the T6 level or higher. So if there's a sub lesion stimulation, for example, if there are contractions or uh, vaginal uh, examination, it might trigger autonomic dysreflexia. So everything that is uh, above the, the lesion, so for example, the, 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 the patient, the person could have a very, uh, a very strong headache or becoming all red and having a thoracic uh, uh, signs. So it's important to intervene immediately because it might lead to a heart complication. So we know that this risk is present in persons who have a lesion at the sixth level or higher. So how to remediate to that? Well, you need to have a, a 
uh, early uh, epidural. If it's not possible to have early epidural, because you can't apply the technique, then in that case, you need to consider the C-section under general anesthesia, anesthesia in order to reduce the risks. So we talked about uh, the stages of labor, catheterization as needed. If it descends too much uh, during labor, there can be complications after delivery. So it's uh, important to do catheterization as needed. Fourth, fourth stage of labor. Two hours after uh, delivery, a nurse will check the patient frequently. If uh, we check if uh, the person can empty their bladder easily, if not, uh, we will uh, take action to make sure there is no distension. Some uh, postpartum recommendations. Uh, early mobilization, like we said, more risks of thrombophlebitis. For everyone, we uh, uh, recommend early mobilization. If there's a woman who uh, cannot do this, if, who is uh, in a wheelchair, we go an anti prophylaxis. And uh, also up to six weeks postpartum because you still have your pregnancy hormones uh, for up to six weeks after. So risks are still present. With lactation, uh, if someone has difficulty with this because of their physical disability to get the baby to latch on, uh, to breastfeed, we have lactation consultants, if needed, okay, who can discuss different positions for uh, for breastfeeding, and so we encourage breastfeeding. Of course, before uh, leaving the hospital, we talk about contraception. For uh, women who are breastfeeding, we use contraceptives with pro progesterones. For others, we can use estrogen, progesterone, usual ones. There's implants, U IUDs, and condoms, of course. So just a few words uh, to say that before the person leaves the hospital, we do have a discussion about contraception. And we do see them normally six to eight weeks after delivery uh, to uh, make sure everything is back to normal. Of course, uh, we give advice before the person leaves the hospital. In conclusion, what uh, we have to know is for all women who have physical uh, disabilities, in most cases, a majority of cases, pregnancy is possible. Of course, you need a pre-pregnancy assessment. If there are things to be assessed, we can do it. And uh, to have a better idea, for so that women can have a better idea on the risks for their future pregnancy. You have to remember uh, taking uh, folic acid for everyone and four to five milligram for people uh, that have a higher risk, three months pre-consumption, of course. And of course, follow up. Uh, of pregnancy and delivery and postpartum has to be adapted for each uh, patient, personalized. 